Hello, and thank you all for coming tonight. I'm Nick Rowan, the managing editor of The Lamp. I'd like to thank the Institute for Human Ecology for hosting us at Catholic University for this debate. We do two of these events a year, one in the spring and one in the fall, and we are always heartened to see such a good turnout. When I think on the subject of damnation, I sometimes remember the observation of Sir Thomas Brown about the final judgment. There will appear at the last day strange and unexpected examples, both of his justice and his mercy, Brown wrote. And therefore, to define either is folly in man and insolence even in the devils. That being said, we have two people on the stage who are ready to do just that. In what we hope is a fruitful discussion of hell through literature, theology, and art, um, representing the pro-hell, if I may, side, <laughs> is the editor of The Lamp, Matthew Walther. He is a contributing opinion writer at the New York Times and is currently writing a biography of St. John Henry Newman for Yale University Press. And on the other side of the debate is Jordan Daniel Wood, who holds a PhD in historical theology from Boston College. He is author of The Whole Mystery of Christ, Creation as Incarnation and Maximus Confessor, and is currently translating the letters of St. Maximus. I'll let you two take it from here. All right, well, looking around at the number of chairs used, I can see that nobody here agrees with uh, Satra that uh, hell is other people. Um, so thank you all for showing up. I often think of uh, a wonderful stray remark made by one of the greatest theologians of the second half of the 20th century, also the author of the best, the best named author of a short catechism, um, who said that the function of debate is to clean one another's glasses. And I've always thought that was a wonderfully neat definition. So to start tonight's proceedings, we're going to take the unusual tack of beginning by attempting each of us to state the position of the other as we best understand it, and then uh, commencing with the cleaning of the glasses. So to start, um, Jordan is going to uh, make the case for hell, and uh, we apologize to anybody joining us by live stream late who thinks that he's uh, turned infernalist. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Matthew. I like the uh, remark that you bring up, except when I realize that I'm the only one on the stage with glasses. So, um, I think I left mine um, actually in my bag, so I hope that doesn't mean I'm going to be too intransigent. <laughs> um, so it seems to me that um, there are two versions of the case for hell. And I think a lot of a lot of times they come together in one perspective. One I think is that um, the weight of the plain reading of scriptures, the weight of the tradition, uh, is more or less on the side, both in the East and in the West, uh, of a consensus position that there is such a thing as at least the possibility of hell. I mean, I, I think it should be noted at least that early on it was more than just a possibility of hell, but that the weight seemed to be something more like the guarantee that some, if not most, will go to hell. So I think there's already been a, sh a shift there. Um, but nevertheless, there still is the, at least the consensus on that possibility of hell. And then I think when it comes to the question, which is an early one and one that I think is intrinsic to the gospel and, and to the gospel of uh, God is the father of all who wills that all should be saved. The question about how does this comport with God's goodness and God's omnipotence and God's ability to bring his own will uh, to pass. Usually people feel like, well, look, I don't know how to explain that. Uh, and that's part of the mystery of God. It's God's prerogative. And so we just can't really pry into those things. And so I think there's that version which says, look, I'm just sort of following the common consensus uh, of actual historic Christianity. Um, I'm not really necessarily claiming to be able to 
explain why that is and ultimately isn't it god's judgment after all who's who's he's the only one that's prerogative to do that at the end i think those then that want to go further though and make a little more sense out of it will usually and i think it's a little more common now uh than it once was uh they will appeal to free will and i think it's probably familiar to most people here the logic will go something like uh exactly because god didn't just want robots or automatons he wanted um friends ultimately friendship with god is the, the goal of the christian life you can't have that without love without reciprocation without the ability therefore at least the possibility of rejection and non-reciprocation and so in order to to put it like in the terms that ratzinger does in his eschatology book in order he, he says that god uh respects absolutely and, and tolerates the conditions of human freedom. And so since human freedom is a requisite for the uh, exchange of love and a loving relationship, we have to at least hold out the possibility that one could utterly and totally reject that. There, that rejection would issue into the state of hell. So yes, perhaps we won't say, say like the Council of Trent's catechism did, that uh, divine justice pursues and inflicts every species of malediction on the damned. Uh, instead, we'll say, like the Catechism now says, something more like uh, it's a self-willed condition. So just a note there, that's already a development. But nevertheless, it's, um, it's one that still has a continuity that's perceptible. And so, uh, so you know, the C.S. Lewis move, the hell is locked you know, the door of hell is locked from the inside, or however you want to cash it out. It's an absolute respect of freedom, and freedom understood under the, the, uh, uh, the mode of, or sort of under the definition of libertarian freedom, the ability to choose or accept or reject. And so very often I think that that's, that's where kind of the explanation for the logic of hell nowadays comes in. I don't think that was always the dominant view or the do dominant version, even within the consensus tradition. But nevertheless, I think it's the most popular one now. And the one that has some of the most intuitive, it makes the most intuitive sense. So I think that that's how I would conclude the case for hell. You know, uh, this is you know, over the gates. This is the work of divine love and mercy or whatever, the gates of hell. It's, it's an absolute respect, a, a kind of digni dignification, a kind of treating of the person as, as a mature adult rather than an infantile uh, uh, immature creature or a robot, and so both the the weight of scripture and and the and the weight of the tradition uh, lead that way, and then our reflections on freedom and love also make more sense out of that. But ultimately, still, nevertheless, the judgment is God's, and so that's where the mystery comes in. That's what I think is perhaps the most common today and most cogent case for hell in a nutshell. Well, thank you, Jordan, for stating some of my position uh, warmly and generously. Um, I think it's important in trying to make the case for universalism um, to say at the outset that, um, in my case, that it was one that I, in one version, accepted once upon a time, so I can enter into it um, with a certain kind of, I hope, sensitivity and familiarity. Um, but the other thing to say at the outset is that when we talk about universalism, I think it's important to make a distinction. As far as I know, these are not terms of art, but I recognize a kind of intuitive dichotomy between what you might call hard and soft universalism. Um, to take them in reverse order, um, soft universalism, as far as I can tell, is a huge constellation of positions that ranges from um, what we all say, or most of us, in the uh, the Fatima prayer in our rosaries, uh, when we ask uh, that God might lead all souls to heaven, 
um, all the way up to a sort of presumptive case, not unlike what I learned, you know, in my own catechism class as a as a child, which was that, you know, basically everyone goes to heaven except for really bad people like Hitler. Um, all the way up to a belief that um, I think it is ultimately indistinguishable from what I would call hard universalism, which simply put, as far as I can tell, is the position that you might state almost after the manner of a syllogism. Um, and by the way, I think it's really important to say that contrary to how a lot of people on the other side frame it, uh, where universalism is just this sort of wishy-washy, emotional thing that might be nice to believe, but intellectually is not rigorous. For me, I would say that it's it's the opposite case. That I, I would say the opposite, that um, there's a very straightforward, logical, reasonably robust case for universalism that basically says, you know, God is omnibenevolent, wills the salvation of all, God is also omnipotent, therefore he will accomplish the salvation of all. And you might say that that sounds too neat, um, but people say think the same thing about the ontological argument, which, you know, Bertrand Russell said he couldn't find any um, convincing way of arguing against, but he just knew that it couldn't be true. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, many defenders of hell, if they, if they think about it that way, might find themselves in a similar position. But one could also argue from Scripture, from certain of the fathers, or maybe with the most force, simply by analogy. Um, both of us on this stage are fathers of children, I assume there are many uh, parents in the audience here tonight. Who of you, of your own children, would say that if your children had, had disobeyed you, that you would punish them eternally, that you would not eventually relent or acknowledge that, um, that the lesson had been learned, so to speak, and that it was time to come out of the corner or um, be allowed to play Nintendo again, or whatever the, whatever the case may be. <laughs> and um, and it, but it, if if that's too soft soap, then I I think we we can go back to the realm of philosophy and say that sort of libertarian free will is not only profoundly unclassical, but totally at odds with the idiom of the gospel, and that this narrow conception of free will as having the absolute ability at any given time, unencumbered, whether ontologically or epistemically or whatever, to do absolutely whatever you want, it's maybe not a Christian understanding of freedom. Um, but I think, as I say, like... Um, it's about more than that, because the universalist position, at least um, as I understand the hard universalist position to be, in the fullness of it, is not just a narrow question about whether at the end of the fourth quarter or the second overtime or what have you, there are ultimately any losers. It's a, it's a broader cosmological uh, position about the restoration of the entire universe, about God being all in all. And so, among other things, I think that one of the things about universalism is that, and that this speaks to how I became interested in the position myself, um, if we can go back to brackets and I can pretend that I'm not actually making this argument. Um, why I was drawn to it is that it helps us to avoid a certain kind of seemingly facile theodicy 
where we find ourselves in a position to uh, of having to look at um, children who are victims of natural disasters or victims of sexual abuse or any other, I don't want to make this a catalog of horrors, but things of that uh, caliber of awfulness and say, well, it's just God's will. Because of the total cosmological picture envisioned by hard universalism, I think, is one that allows us to to erase evil entirely, to see it as so many sort of fanged shadows on the walls of our terrestrial cave. And we don't have to try to find some ultimate meaning in evil. We don't even have to play the game of trying to say that by economy God can bring X out of Y. We can just say what was visited upon this person, this child, under these horrifying circumstances is false and damnable, and we can adopt um, the uh, this view of the unreality of evil. So if I might quote from one of the most eminent of our Anglican divines, Piglet in the Winnie the Pooh books, um, Hef, said Piglet, breathing so hard that he could hardly speak, Hef, Hef, Hefalump, Hellum, a great enormous thing like nothing. And this is what evil is revealed to be. Um, or if you prefer, in St. John's Apocalypse, uh, one of the only instances, I think, in which Chaloner's uh, revision of the Douay manages to surpass the Bible of 1611. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold the tabernacle of God with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself with them shall be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and death shall be no more, nor mourning, nor crying, nor sorrow shall be any more. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. So that sort of Loose grouping of arguments, I think, would be how I conceive of the the hard universalist position as opposed to uh, the range of soft universalist views most famously uh, perhaps espoused by the author of the afterword to Meditations Upon the Tarot. Uh, so with that, we'll go to Jordan and he can correct the... Uh, no doubt, tremendous violence which I've inflicted upon his position. No, that's wonderful. Uh, Pooh Bear was always my favorite set of books, and now there's something of a of a revelation going on to me about my own childhood. Now it plays into my eschatological views now. So thank you. Um, I was always terrified by that dream that they have, and they're all dancing around. It's really, really twisted. Uh, but, um, no, I, uh, yeah, I, I think all that's very well put. I mean, uh, so much of that, I would just give a hearty amen to, I don't, um, I don't really have any part of what you stated and how you stated it that I would change. Probably the only thing I would do is add a few other things. Um, one question I constantly have as a parent, like to go along with the analogy to extend it a little bit is one of the great tasks of parenting is to figure out who the hell your child is. Just to know, well, I, I did it. I did intend that. Yes, that pun. Um, and you know, you can read the parenting books as many of us have have done. You can ask other parents. You can say what worked for you. You can say, well, you know, how can you get them to sleep for the night or whatever? Or as they get older, you know, you talk about their fears and their worries and what happened to them. That the thing they won't tell you that happened, but you're trying. You know, that's really what's going on and what they're reacting to. And the whole thing is one sort of drama. One sort of um, it's it's one kind of uh, peculiar task which can't be abstracted because a person can't be abstracted. They can only be experienced. Um, and in order to be a good parent, you don't just have to have the formulae down. You don't just have to have the syllogisms down or the patterns, the strategies. You have to have the attentiveness to know who they are. Who is the person you're dealing with? 
Um, and of course, that, that involves as well your own self-knowledge. Who am I anyway? And then what is this relationship we have? And all that stuff is so difficult, as we all know. Um, and one of the big questions I have from that perspective of God, who, who is a father uh, beyond which I can't even imagine, much less approximate in my own life. And the question I have, it's one actually that comes up uh, in this movie that I love called Calvary, where the priest is talking to a really horrible, twisted, sadistic murderer uh, while he's in prison, and uh, his name's Freddy, and uh, he's joking around about the murders he's committed and just all the worst things. It was just pure evil incarnate almost, right, you would say. And at one point, um, something the priest says kind of sets him down this trail, and he gets less jovial and much more serious and grave. And at a certain point, he says, well, God made me, didn't he? And doesn't he know me, doesn't he? And the priest, uh, the only thing he says back is, if, if anyone knows you, God does. And that's really my question. Does God know his children well enough to know how to get to them? That's not an abstract thing. It's not a syllogism. It's, it's even, for, even for God, it's personal. He's tripersonal, infinitely personal. Is conversion rational? Is repentance rational? Is there a reason that we, we do? Does love have logic, or is it just the counterpoint to syllogism? I think there's something far more positive and fundamental in the infinite love of God, the God who would go all the way to Hades, the God who would travel and find the light. You know, he's not just the father who sits on the porch waiting for the prodigal son, but he's the one who goes and finds the last sheep. So he's both passive and active in his love in a way that's, again, hard to conceptualize. And so that's really kind of one of the things I would add is, so yes, you can go down the De Alexiales controversy, you can try to put it into this, you know, uh, all these different cooperative, operative, grace, provenient grace, how does this relate to free, free will, pre-motion, whatever. But you can also ask the question, um, you know, um, does God know how to get to everyone? Can God get to everyone? Does he know them well enough? And um, if conversion and repentance is, as all, as it is at all rational, then I would think God can do it. It's not beyond them. Sometimes I think that the free will defense in particular basically just poses a new version of prime matter that God has to contend with. God is faced with the, the, the sheer neutrality of, our, of, 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 what, of the fact that he could be rejected. He just simply doesn't know what to do to get his will to come to pass. I have no problem thinking that, as Ratzinger says, that, uh, Ratzinger says in his eschatology book that we have in the past traditionally thought of conversion too much in terms of a particular time, and we should instead think of the entire life, the whole process as one long, extended, comprehensive answer to God's grace. Um, that, I think, is, is spot on, and it's exactly right. But then that entails the very thing that the analogy we began with does, which is, can, does God know all of us? Could, does he know us completely every step of the way so that he can bring about, at that certain point, the kind of conversion, right, repentance, uh, his kindness, which leads to repentance, according to Romans 2. And I just think he can, and he will. And so I think that's that's the kind of that's where I'm so I don't I like you know, I'm I'm good friends with and I like and I support sort of this the syllogistic arguments and cases have been made and books that have been laid out but I I also recognize that you know life itself doesn't conform to a syllogism um, and so but I also but I don't think for that reason life itself is devoid and love itself is devoid of a logic I just think it presents a, a different higher more synthetic logic that's even, it's, it's beyond even our conceptual grasp. But it doesn't mean it's spontaneous. It doesn't mean it's purely random. It doesn't mean that God couldn't figure out what that thing is in us that resists. He couldn't crack the code. We are a black box to him. And so that to me is one of the, one of the ways I would, I would put it, make it a little more existential. I mean, there is a sort of syllogistic thing there. You still could cite the sort of formal, more traditional categories and, and take sides or try to make a synthesis. But really, at the end of the day, I do think, like you said, that analogy is sort of the, uh, really the heart of it. Uh, 
There are several other things I would want to add, but I don't know how far to go. I would, I would want to speculate that we haven't necessarily done justice yet to um, uh, what sin does to the subject. Usually we think of like the sinner as kind of this uh, unified agency or agent who, uh, who sins and just misses the mark or something like that. But I think the New Testament language is far more bizarre and paradoxical. Both when it comes to sin, because when I sin, I put on some old ancient man. I become something I'm not. I become something that, in fact, I'm told in Colossians 2 to, or Colossians 3, to, um, to sever and bury. And so that I'm crucified with Christ and I no longer live, though Christ lives in me. And so, okay, that's bizarre. Or Ephesians 2 saying, uh, you have been crucified with Christ and you were raised with him in the past. You were raised with him through faith and are seated at the right hand of the Father in Christ Jesus. So there's this kind of bifurcation in both directions of the subject. The subject who's damned and the subject who's saved. And I'm not totally sure that our, our theology and our, even our sort of dogmatic formulations have done full justice to that. Even Ratzinger worries. His worry in eschatology against uh, Origen is that he says he, he worries that Origen gives too much weight this is sort of interesting. Too much weight to the evil as privation. Balthazar speaks about the unusable residue in Theodrama 5. Um, and as I said, Paul just speaks about the old man that needs to be killed. The thing about that is that I've identi- identified myself with the old man, and so I do have to die. I have to be crucified. And then, I have to, and then I'm resurrected. So the pattern isn't the syllogism there of salvation. The pattern is death and resurrection. And uh, and as uh, maybe uh, one last little thing, as Bonhoeffer said, <laughs> uh, it's not as if the death or the passion is the uh, presupposition, you might say, like the minor or major premise of the conclusion for the resurrection. The resurrection has no presupposition. It is the truth. And so uh, I do I do think that the universalist perspective could do with a little bit more of this um this existential flair, this existential uh, weight that needs to contend with. It needs to contend with the fact that life doesn't con- conform to the syllogism without giving up the rationality of love and conversion. Thank you. Now now I have to turn around and put on my Batman villain face or whatever. I guess it's <laughs> time to get to the less pleasant stuff. Um <clears throat> I thought that Jordan, in talking about the uh, the pro case, if if we want to call it that, for help, <clears throat> managed really to uh, to mention all my arguments. But for me, I think it's just a question of the relative weight that we assign to them. Um, but before I get to the the thing that I would put a lot more emphasis on, what I want to mention is just that I talked earlier and try to flesh out a sort of provisional universalist case about how, as I said, a lot of people would say that universalism is a feel-good position. Um, but that if you think about, if you try to think about it with any kind of like if you try to bring any kind of analytic clarity or rigor to bear on it, you know, you'll realize that hell has to be the answer. And I've said that for me, um, it's very much the opposite. And I think, to be clear, what I mean is I can follow that syllogism up until the point when I think about myself and I think about those little moments when I know what it means to reject the good, to do it heartily and emphatically in the moment, shouting down in an almost, you know, barbaric antinomian manner, the voice of conscience. And I know worse still what it means to reflect back on those moments and say, yes, and I'm still glad that I did it. And when I think about things like that, I think I have a sense of what it would mean 
uh, to be in hell, to reject love, to reject mercy. Um, but what I really want to talk about, the, the, the part of my position um, that I, I really want to bring to the forefront is that I think that the weight of the tradition matters enormously and that it matters enormously regardless of where one comes down um, on another sort of continuum whose existence I think is worth alluding to, right? Because just as I said, there's a sort of hard universalism and then there's a soft universalism. On the infernalist side, if we want to put it that way, there is, similarly speaking, what one might call a rigorous position, which be- begins with um, certain things in Scripture and with a tradition that certainly existed among the fathers that wants to insist upon the small number of the saved. And there is a homiletic tradition in the Counter-Reformation era. Think of... Um, the, the most famous example, one that I'm sure uh, some of you have probably seen, like pamphlet reprints of uh, sitting on a coffee table for sale at Mass, is by uh, Len- uh, St. Leonard of Port Morris talking about, you know, how few will be saved. And then there's another position which, oddly enough, and this is one of those things that these weird incongruities that I feel like a lot of people don't want to talk about, is that if you look at, like, the hardline sort of Thomistic manualist position on the eve of the Second Vatican Council. It was very far removed from the rigorist one. In fact, the kind of classic formulation of it um, from uh, Garigou Lagrange basically says, like, at least slightly more than 50% of the human race is going to have to be saved because with the sort of hard uh, Thomas clarity, you know, uh, cashed out into arithmetic, it would be unfitting for the kingdom of Satan, just in matter of number, to be larger than that of the kingdom of God. Um, so I, I make no strong claim one way or the other about um, the population of hell. But I think that there is a strong traditionalist argument to be made that it isn't empty. Um, And the reason for it for me is, in a sort of curious paradoxical way, I ask myself, well, what do we lose if we lose hell? Um... And already I sound like a a twisted maniac, at least to some segment of our audience. But I think it's a serious question. Because we lose a lot of things. Just at the most basic offhand level of the average Catholic in the pews, we lose the everyday familiar idiom of the act of contrition when we say, I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. We lose centuries of Christian art. We end up in it, we, we find ourselves in a position where we regard um, Milton the way that we would regard the Silmarillion or something. Um, but I think most important and most stressing for me, is I feel like if we want to take the hard universalist position especially, it means jettisoning the, whole, the entire idea that there can be any kind of tangible, competent teaching authority in the church. Now, for um, for a Protestant, 
for um, someone who is not a Catholic or uh, an Orthodox or a member of one of the Oriental churches or whatever, um, this might not be such a big deal and you just shrug your shoulders. But I think that this is just an example of something that the the authorities can't have been this wrong for this long on so many important stages. You know, Jordan mentioned um, Trent earlier, and I think it's really hard to dismiss um, explicit references to the damned in the pronouncements of ecumenical councils as sort of misguided or belonging only to the, you know, idiom of their age. Um, and I don't want to condescend to the authorities and say that, that we know better. Um, and I, I think most important, maybe, we can't talk about this as a question of development because a sort of like paradigmatic case for development is something like the Immaculate Conception where it seems to be implicit in the, in the plain word of Scripture and there's a certain tradition of it going back to apostolic times and there are liturgical commemorations of it from very early and the schoolmen sort of debate and Thomas like Moran gets it wrong. And, but by the time that there is a dogmatic definition um, there's basically a universal commemorate, liturgical commemoration of it. And it's something that, at least in an intuitive offhand sense, the laity have the basic idea of. I don't think you can do an equivalent thing where you said, well, this was a, this was a minority position among the fathers that basically disappeared until the 19th century when we all became a lot, uh, a lot nicer and started to be motivated by a different set of concerns. And so it has to be right. I just don't, I, I, I think from a basic position of epistemic humility, I'm not willing to make this move. Um, and every bit as much, and this is the last thing I'll say, the, every bit as much as I care about um, maintaining that we have to have some kind of competent uh, magisterium. Um, and I, I don't make the lofty claims for it that some would, but um, <laughs> at least ballpark, right? Um, I think that we lose a lot when we lose the basic idiom of like the St. Michael prayer. Um and I, and I have lots of questions about the metaphysics and about the cosmology of hard universalism. Like when we, when we say cast down to hell um, Satan, all of his fallen angels are probably about the world seeking the word of souls, amen. What, what, are we, what are we asking to be delivered from and what fate are we hoping to avoid? Um, and I think it puts us in a position where the Christian religion is... Um, not so much a, a kind of weird mystery religion where its real teaching has just been sort of occluded or semi-occluded for ages and ages, but actually something stranger, this sort of um, Hegelian synthesis that we're just still waiting to, to unfold in front of us, and I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, anyway, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jordan. We'll just talk for a little bit, and then maybe we'll get some questions here. Okay, Matthew. Uh, I'll just respond to the last point there, uh, a few things. Uh, well, <laughs> I I just have to say up front, the <laughs> uh, Hegelian synthesis. Um, the synthesis is a Greek word. It's a word that's used in Canon 4 of Constantinople 2 to clarify the hypostatic union because there it's said that henosis is insufficient because it's vague and can be understood in many ways. So instead, you have to, it says three times, you have to understand the hypostatic un union according to synthesis. Hence, we get the composite person of Christ. The truth that the church not only teaches, but embodies, 
in Yves Congar's words, ongoing synthesis and meaning of uh, the meaning of tradition is Jesus, a person. So we can't be anti-synthesis without including the synthesis who is the word of God made flesh. After all, there is no other way that divinity and humanity can be one except as him. Surely that's a synthesis, just of a different sort. If, as, say, the 19th century Tübingen theologians uh, would be okay with saying that the church is in some sense the ongoing incarnation, then that's a synthesis. Um, I think there is a, there's a way in which epistemic humility can actually belie uh, a little bit more of an arrogance, which says, surely we're done with the synthesis. You can't be done with a person, and certainly not the Word of God. The Word of God, according to section 10 of Dei Verbum, stands above the magisterium, as we know, and yes, it's the sole interpreter. So there's a little bit of a tension there, hermeneutical circle, which is just play, plainly set out for us. I think that's as it should be. And I think uh, a lot of conservative Catholics in this last pontificate have rediscovered that. After all, uh, right, uh, how could we do without the death penalty? When has it ever been taught that it's an intrinsic evil, it's an offense against human dignity, right? Uh, or what about slavery? How many theologians in the pre-modern era said that it's an offense against the image of God to hold slaves. Well, two. St. Gregory of Nyssa did. Also has to be a universalist. Um, and sort of John, blessed John Duns Scotus. All right. So how could they be so wrong for so long? And Leo the, the, the 13th comes along and says, well, that's not just evil. Yeah. Add Molina to that list, I think, too. Such a robust defender of... of uh... I'm mostly going off of not only Noonan's book, but also Christopher Kellum and Father Kellum's book, who says that his was not as strong as Scotus, or certainly not Gregory, who is the strongest, uh, because he has certain cases. So they're not, he's not against... He doesn't think it's per se evil, though he thinks it's functionally at that point, right? The slave, Atlantic slave trade is not licit. But that's not the teaching of Leo the Thirteenth. It's not the teaching of Vatican II. It's not the teaching of uh, Saint John Paul II. According to whom it is per se evil. There is no mitigation there. How could they be so wrong for so long? How many people would have liked to know that in the intervening centuries, and the hundreds of thousands of people enslaved would have been nice to know? As Kellerman says at the end of his book, in no uncertain certain terms say in the 16th century it would have been a mortal sin for the, for the slave to run away from the slave master, according to the magisterium. It is exactly the opposite from the 19th and 20th century. It's a mortal sin to hold a slave. So I think we need to be careful about saying, so like the Immaculate Conception is the paradigmatic case. I would think uh, we need to do some justice to the actual liminal cases, which are far more revealing precisely because they're shocking. That's where you start to get into the real synthesis of uh, the development of doctrine. Because if we're not going to just do it syllogistically, or, and I know at the high Middle Ages, that's how they wanted to do it. We're going to make it explicit from implicit premises. That was an easy way to do it. It makes sense. It's abstractly far more cogent and doesn't shock us so much. Just, just isn't the way, you know, in my opinion, that's not the way the actual life of the church, the ongoing synthesis, who is Christ in and as his body, has actually developed. So unless we're going to make our theories sort of superimposed on the actual life or the organism, the person of the body of Christ, who is the church, I think we should, we should approach it the other way around. And we, that goes down to all kinds of stuff. I mean, right? We get, we get, you know, the Latin Vulgate. Isn't that the, according to Trent, authentic text? I still think it is. <laughs> well, <laughs> Pius XII and Divino Aflante, 1943, doesn't. I mean, he, he'll want to say, yeah, you still have to read that in church. Like, it's still sort of, yeah. But he, he says explicitly in that text, in that encyclical, he says that the originals hold, quote, more authority and greater weight than any translation, ancient or, or modern. And he's going to kind of waffle a little bit in 1950, no doubt. But nevertheless, it's, uh, you know, this is the stuff of actual, the actual life of the church. So 
I don't like the Hegelian synthesis move and the kind of like, well, and it's it's pretty predictable how how development's going to go. And I know this is probably going to get me even more in hot water, perhaps. Uh, but I'm sort of with Ronner on this that uh, <laughs> that um, there is no such thing as an absolute adequate abstract theory of doctrine, which I don't think should be surprising since the synthesis is a person and try to give me an abstract synthesis or extra abstract formula for any person, much less the infinite person of God. So I think it's actually, it's a mark, at least it can be a mark of epistemic humility to not foreclose the infinite revelation and the person of the word of God in, say, the first 16 centuries. In 6,000 years, 600,000 years, 6 million years, we're the early church. There's still far more to reveal. Not new thing, I understand the datum, I I get it, the deposit of faith. And yes, I know Vatican I says, well, don't just appeal to deeper meanings. Well, that's a, kind of what you have to do with no salvation outside the church, as Avery Dulles pointed out in 1973. What's the deeper thing? Well, turns out, even though Clement VI said in 19, uh, 1351 to the Arminians that you have to be, quote, obedient to the Roman pontiff or you will go down to hell immediately. Well, it turns out uh, even an act of goodwill sufficiently can mysteriously and invisibly unite you to the body of Christ. Seems like a deeper meaning. So point being, there's quite a lot of uh, other cases that I would wonder why they're not paradigmatic for development. So I think there's that point about development here, and I think the fact that this has always been sort of just below the surface in the entirety in every age of the church gives it sort of at least it's worth a hearing. It's worth considering whether or not a development could happen at all towards that. And the development has happened towards that on this exact issue. It's very clear that what Trent was teaching the catechism about hell and the way it characterizes hell is definitely not what it's taught now. Now, it's not the same thing as, say, reversing the possibility of hell. For that, I think we need actual clear proposals, real so not abstractions about what is or isn't possible before we consider what's actually being proposed. And I, and I think there is where some speculative work in theology could help and aid, but I don't want to go drone on and on the details of that. But I just think, nevertheless, on the point of development, I think it's just as presumptuous to be abstractly opposed to development on a particular idea and perspective as it is to be abstractly, uh, uh, you know, supportive of it, just sort of as inevitable or sort of within the times or something like that. So I'm against both of those because I think the only real synthesis is a living one. So on that, I mean, one of my questions would be, though, um, hell's position in Christian iconography, in the basic idiom of the faith, especially at the level of the average ordinary worshiper or whatever, are you are you not do you not have any misgivings about that? Because whatever you can say about the church's record with slavery or whatever, I don't think you would propose that, like, um, a, a misguided equivocation between slavery as it existed in in um, Roman law and uh, chattel slavery played uh, the central role in the life of the average Christian that, um, you know, that hell did you know, in the 16th century uh, from then to the present, right? I mean, it depends on if the Christian was the slave. It seems then it would thoroughly characterize their experience as a Christian. Um, I also think, though, that it's about the dignity of the human person. I mean, I don't think that's even controversial post-Vatican II that there has been a greater, fundamental, more profound sense of the dignity of the human person. I'm not sure what's more central than that. But... I still take your point about the iconography. The, the, I would just say, you know, look, Evagrius, he's a notorious, you know, uh, um, universalist. Go read what he has to say about contemplating hell and, and on discernment in the Philokalia. He's got a lot to say. What about Origen? Go read some of his sermons on what will flash before you at the judgment. It's a lot like hell, a lot of fire, a lot of pain, a lot of judgment. 
So I don't see why on the level of the image, universalism would be any less fitting of an interpretation of the image. It's not like you're removing the image. You are reconceptualizing it, maybe reframing it. I actually think you're making it more profound because what it comes, what it comes to for me, uh, uh, here's an example from scripture. Let's, do, let's use the hardest book for me, right? The Apocalypse of John. <laughs> Lots of images, says in verse 3 in the very first chapter, that it's going to be given, this book's going to be given in signs in the Greek, so it says in signs, signified. Um, if anybody's a bad guy in the Apocalypse of John, besides the unholy trinity of the dragon and right, the two beasts, it's the kings of the earth. In fact, they're always arrayed against God's elect. They're destroyed, I think, twice, maybe three times in the book, uh, along with the whole world. Um, and they are even destroyed in chapter 20, thrown into the lake of fire, or of sulfur. Um, the names blotted out of the Lamb's book of life, right? All that stuff, like, all the, like the damned, right? They're damned, okay? <laughs> the kings of the earth are damned. Let's just... But there they are in, in chapter 21. They show up at the New Jerusalem. It says that, they br- that the nations and the kings of the earth bring their glory into the New Jerusalem. You might say, ah, ha, spoils of war. No, 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 go a few verses later in around, around verse 27. Nothing impure shall enter its gates. Okay, so the kings of the earth have been pulverized. They've been sent to hell. They've gone into the lake. They've burned with the fire which burns forever and ever. All the stuff you want, all the images you want, everything you want, it's there. It's just that that's not the entire end for the true kings of the earth who show up also in the New Jerusalem. In fact, so I think so, so I was interested. It was interesting. I was noticing this the other day. Somebody was so nervous about that that somewhere in the 16th century they added to the Greek uh, <laughs> in some manuscript that I can't find yet, but the King James uh, does it and says the, it says the nations. Uh, of those who are saved <laughs> came in. So it's like someone noticed, so well, hold on a second, they're not supposed to be you know, be here. Uh, they're the bad guys the whole time. They've been destroyed over and over again. They've been judged. They've been uh, sent through fire, but now here they are. Um, that's, I can't find it in any manuscript whatsoever. Nobody, nobody else translates it that way, and I ha- haven't since. Uh, the only place I could find it is in the 1550 Westcott uh, Hort. In any case, um, we got all the images there. So I don't see where the images are going. I don't see why they're, 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 uh, they have to be removed or excised from the tradition at all. Um, no, you know, in fact, I can't think of a single universalist in Christian history that doesn't use just as much, or in the words of one author, in the case of Origen and Greg of Nyssa, sometimes they dwell on it even longer than, say, St. Ignatius, Ignatius of Loyola does. So I, I don't know. I, I guess I don't. I don't quite accept that that sort of argument um, either. Um, I think I think universalism, on the terms that I would like to propose it, understood properly, is far more terrifying, because it implies not just that I will be separated, but that I will come to see my own failure. I can think back and agree uh, with with something bad, and I and there I might be. I might think that I'm really facing something serious, something grave, something real, when really it's nothing all along, like Piglet said. Um, um, but the real victory will be when I come to see how false I made myself, and I come to agree with the divine word of judgment over myself, and then will God triumph. And I think that's, so none of that means an excision of judgment. None of that means to remove the fires. None of that removes, uh, means any of that. There's more speculative proposals as well we could entertain, like Trent Pomplin talks about the very elastic uh, use of avum and eternitas in Latin, even in Latin scholasticism. We could talk about a relative age thing, that uh, an incalculable age that's nevertheless finite. So there's ways to pr- make concrete proposals that I still think could also respect the magisterial teaching. But I don't, I don't see in principle why this couldn't develop and why it couldn't also retain all the same images in the art and literature in the hymns and also do even maybe fuller justice to these other things like for the sake of your sorrowful passion, have mercy on us in the whole world. When I pray that, and then I think of Romans 5, hope does not disappoint for the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Why can't we also say that that should be 
uh, deepened, made more profound and more meaningful in our spirituality and in our art and in our literature. So before we um, turn it over for questions here, the one thing that I, I wanted to say, which is not a direct response to uh, what Jordan was talking about, but I just wanted to squeeze it in so it's kind of tangentially related that I think is really important for those of us um, in the infernalist camp to take away from any kind of argument about universalism is that I think if you consider it a hypothetical and you just instrumentalize it, it does help you to clarify what I think is a kind of dangerous way that, um, you know, despite our best efforts, I think is, it creeps into how all Christians think about salvation, a dangerous way of, of conceiving not just the Christian religion, but the ends and purpose of human life as a kind of contest where we're supposed to set out like the revelers in Chaucer's partner's tale to defy and cheat death. Um, or as this, um, this sort of athletic contest where by, uh, seizing upon this or that advantage that is, you know, fairly or otherwise been conferred to us, we can sort of eke out the victory over hell, um, and win eternal life. Um, and I think... You know, it's important to recognize that if I were to hear somehow, unmistakably, and I can't even imagine what this would be like, but it's a hypothetical, you know, the voice of God himself saying, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. Um, Malina's enemies were right. You are definitely just going to hell no matter what. Now, I would be wrong in thinking this, uh, because in this hypothetical, there's no free will or whatever. But I would think to myself, well, I'm still going to go to Mass. I'm still going to pray. I'm still going to glory in the risen Christ and worship him and um, be in awe of the... Um, lighted red lamps in the sanctuary. And I think it's, it's useful to remember that when we talk about what, what sainthood is, which is the end we are all ultimately pursuing, worshiping God, um, that's really the same thing in a better way of, as in a better way of thinking of this other kind of conventional thing that we can uh, find ourselves thinking about as, as the end of, of human life, which is trying to win eternal salvation. And so for that reason, and I think about this all the time as a, a First Communion teacher this year, please pray for all the poor souls entrusted to my care. Um, uh, they just did their first confessions a couple months ago, and they are preparing for their first Holy Communions. And so we talked about imperfect and perfect contrition. And I think if you're trying to understand the distinction, I think you can use universalism as a hypothesis, as a kind of crude instrument to, uh, to help yourself understand what it means in the act of contrition to say, uh, because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, but most of all, because they, being my sins, Offend thee, O God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. Um, anyway, with that, just looking at the time, let's uh, take some questions here. Um, the only thing I'll say just right up front is they should be questions, not monologues, soliloquies, marriage proposals. Uh, we're both spoken for. So uh, anyway, go ahead. Thank you both. Um, I have 
questions for each of you. And since I probably only get the mic once, I'll just throw it out there and you guys can figure out who wants to answer first. Um, two, I guess, sort of data points that I would like each of you to respond to um, for Matthew, Matthew, right? Matthew, yes. Um, what do you make, since the weight of the tradition is so heavy and vast with, for um, infernalism, as you put it, um, why is it, and maybe this is not a fair question, why is it that the doctrine of eternal hell has not been, like, defined and, like, added to the creed? Like, if it's so, so much there, why has it not been added to the creed? And I don't know if that's a fair question, but that's just something that I would like your thoughts on. And then for um, Jordan, um, the thing I would like your thoughts on is, what do you make of the Marian apparitions that have been approved by the church? And, you know, it just is like, why would Mary not say, like, if, if hell is ultimately, like, just like a longer purgation, why would Mary not just say, like, there are many souls in purgatory, you know, and, like, suffering? And so I just would like your thoughts on how you'd react to that part, that datum in the, you know, the body of Christ, which is, this is real. So, yeah. Thank you so much for that. That uh, puts us both in a slightly rougher spot than we were a few minutes ago. Um, but for me, um, I would say, I think with not very much hesitation that I think that eternal hell is baked into the magisterium. And I think that um, if, I think it's almost um, sort of anachronistic or a category mistake to assume that earlier magisterial pronouncements would try in clear-cut language to refer to something as eternal that was presumed by everyone to be eternal and which was not a matter of debate. It's not like the reformers, you know, um, in the lead up to Trent were primarily concerned with uh, these these issues which don't really return um, to, uh, you know, plague theology until the 19th century. Uh, and so I think that you have plenty of magisterial pronouncements on hell and... Uh, no one is wondering whether it's eternal or not. Um, so that would be my answer. Um, but uh, Jordan, if you want to, you can respond to that part of it or talk about Fatima. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <laughs> uh, the only thing I would say in response to, to what Matthew was saying was, uh, Again, I, I think it's just a, maybe it's a different view of like the role of theology in the magisterium and their relationship or what it is. But if we can't look at the word, if we have to restrict what some, what magisterial teaching can mean to what it was, what, what it intended in its historical conditions, uh, then Otaviani was right about a lot of things at Vatican II. For the record, I think he was. <laughs> so... I, I don't, um, and so uh, I, I don't think the um, uh, one, one writer that I like, but I won't name because I'm not sure how that will cast a shadow on me one way or the other, but um, said that the difference between um, God's words and our words is that um, uh, we always mean uh, we, we always mean more than we intend, and God never does. Um, and so I don't know if that. Uh, I don't see how that would change with the, the human words of the of the magisterium as well, which are certainly inspired. But it is interesting to me that we don't read the magisterium as if it were inspired the way we do scripture. Uh, you and I know people hate that, and they hate the like, oh, you're going for the spirit and all that. I'm like, well, yeah, the spirit gives life; the letter kills. Uh, so, what's inspired has to be approached according to the character of what it means to be inspired. It doesn't mean being encapsulated and exhaustively explained in its depths by a formula. Otherwise, it's just finite, which isn't God. So it's not divine, divinely inspired. Um, now, can that become a license for just make anything you want? Of course, that's Vatican I. That's the check there, right? That's exactly what they're concerned about. 
But when even in Donum Veritatis, it's said that we need to dare and, 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 and you need to go deeper or say in De Verum, where it says that the word or, or that the church is always progressing in its understanding and its depths of the, of the word of God until the end of the ages when it's complete and perfected. I take those at face value. So actually, I read those literally. Um, nevertheless, so I think there needs to be a kind of a theology of inspiration. And I think there's a sort of poor way to do deference to the inspiration, the divine authority of the magisterium by reducing it to just superhuman calculations and formulas. I think the true respect for it would be to treat it like you do the inspiration of Scripture. Um, and I think Peter Hunerman, the other, second, the other editor of Denzinger, is the, is the only person I've seen that make, make that point. Uh, so there's a, there's a theological hermeneutics of the magisterium that should be at play as well. There's also levels. I mean, this isn't even really disputable. There's different levels of authority. We, you know, de fide credenda, de fide tenenda, all that. Um, and so on that point, I would say certainly I don't, I don't think, I, I wouldn't propose removing eternal at all. I just don't necessarily know if we fully comprehend what eternal means yet, and that would be the exact thing in dispute. So we'd have to look at actual concrete proposals, and I can think of like three of them off the top of my head, but I won't get into those. So, so the, but that would be the the, the, the approach. As for the uh, Marian apparitions, it's, it's a similar, uh, you know, it's the same way I would approach, say, Matthew twenty-five or uh, a lot of the texts that talk about hell. I, I specifically think that um, there is nothing in, incongruent or impossibly in, impossible. You know, it's impossible to make compatible with saying that there are some who go to hell, and that that's even distinct from purgatory, I would have a view that would make the same distinction that I think it is, is incumbent upon us to make. Um, don't, I guess what I would say there is just, don't you think it changes the kind of urgency of something like the purported words of Our Lady at Fatima if what she's warning against is not what people conventionally understand it to mean, but what, I guess, on your reading, it would have to cash out to me. Does that make sense? Uh, well, f- well, put put frankly, like I think that there's a big difference in the moral urgency if what she's warning against is eternal hell versus uh, any other thing, right? I guess. I mean, if. It- it's interesting to think like there has to be an absolute perpetual eternal conscious torment or else it's not a serious threat. Uh, it seems like a bizarre calculus. I didn't say it wasn't serious. I said it's, it's less, well, right? Well, yeah, anything less than perpetual uh, bad infinity is, le- is by definition less, I guess. But I'm not sure that makes it qualitatively less urgent morally. I wouldn't want to equate those. Like, even just put it in a crude analogy... If the cliff you're about to walk off is 50 feet and you might survive, I'd still warn you, just because it wasn't 150. Uh, so I still think it's pretty urgent and morally urgent, and you could die and get hurt or whatever. So I, I, it's just it's strange to me to be, to be like, well, the warning isn't really going to. I mean, I mean, the warning isn't really effective or urgent unless it's absolute. The other thing, too, that, that I would want to say is, uh, well, I mean, for one thing, I mean, the, the, I, I do have to just say there is no inco- there's nothing incumbent, at, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know, uh, upon taking apparitions as like, like, say, on the same level as the creed or even the second level, the professio fide, the, the, the paragraphs that uh, afterwards, the commentary on it. I mean, uh, there, that, that is that is not I mean, yes, they're approved, they're legitimate and all that. But to, but to this is something that happens all the time. Uh, there's this kind of flattening of everything. Everything is worth everything. Everything is worth the same amount. It's all the same weight. And, and on top of that, it's all very clear what it means. Not at all. I don't think that's a Catholic way to view any of that. So, so I wouldn't. So it's not that I would downplay that. I don't treat that the same way I do Scripture. I don't treat that the same way I would the actual development of the doctrine on the specific doctrine of hell in the magisterium, especially post-Vatican II. Um, and and so, and yet I still think it's incumbent. And part of the reason why I'm not simply, like, as you were saying, or like I don't know, I'm not sure if it's for all Protestants, but let's just say the Protestant is that um, I do feel like a, a sense of like I need to take this into account in some way in my proposal. It it might not be what other people think is like the obvious meaning of it, or it might, in other people's you know opinion, sort of 
deflate the moral urgency of it. I might disagree with that, but I do have to contend with it. And that's the part where I am giving, you know, I would be wanting to give that deference. So I think that we, <laughs> I'll just say one little quick thing and just say, I, I think we have not done sufficient, um, I think there's more theological work that can be done thinking through the subject of damnation. I mean, the, per, the subjectivity of who is damned. Here I'm inspired by someone like St. Maximus the Confessor, um, who, for example, in his allegorical reading of the book of Jonah, he, one of the meanings he gives to Nineveh, which is destroyed, is the, is the human soul. Um, he has a lot of other uh, allegories for that, but one of the things he says, he says, he, he picks up at one point where it says, um, Nineveh, God drops the conditional and just says straight out, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. And of course it isn't. And Maximus poses the question to himself, how in the world can this be? God said it was going to be destroyed. It sounds irrevocable. It almost sounds absolutely morally urgent. And yet it wasn't destroyed. And what he ends up saying is, in truth, this very same city, the same soul was both destroyed and saved. Just like Paul saying, I was crucified. And yet, and I no longer live, yet the life I live, right? So this pattern of the destruction uh, of the person, which is not like external, precisely because it involves me identifying myself with a false incarnation, a false self, which is utterly delusional. And the role of ignorance really needs to be highlighted here. Um, and I think that's the last little thing I would say on this. This is a little far away from the Fatima stuff, but I, I think it's a little too facile to say, well, I know what it's like to know the good and reject it. Far more tragic, and I actually think more severe and morally urgent, is that what I think I know is actually undergirded by a more fundamental deception. I don't even fully, like, like belief and knowledge are not just what you know, but it has depths. The knowing has depth. So that, you know, Jesus can be implored, I believe, help, but help my unbelief. So far more uh, dire of a situation isn't that I know the good and I just reject it and then I applaud myself later for it, but it's that actually I was so fundamentally deceived I did not even know what I did not know and I didn't quite believe to the degree that I even I thought myself I did. Had I, had I believed, I would be like Christ and wouldn't, wouldn't sin. First John. Right up here in the front. I want to thank you both. Matthew, your presentation, I've always inclined to universalism, but I think your opening presentation cinched it for me. So I just want to thank you for that universalist case. But here's a question that I come back to over and over. I have to go to confession. Yeah. <laughs> here's a question I come back to over and over again. So the way that you presented it, namely, God is omnipotent and God desires all to be saved. What I keep coming back to is this question. Given that I don't believe that I saved myself, anytime that I repent, I have the strong sense that, yes, I'm the one repenting, but something is happening in me. Like something happened to me. Like I give thanks for my repentance. I mean, this is why I've always found Augustine so phenomenologically way more compelling than Pelagius or anybody else. It's like, yeah, that, that thing that he's talking about, the thing Tom's talking about, that happens to me regularly, right? I just keep thinking, okay, so if it's really true that God wants all people to be saved and I'm not saved— then at the end of the day, is it, it's not that God didn't have the power, right, to go to what Jordan said, and it's not that God didn't want it. So is it just that God loves my freedom more than he loves me? I mean, and I, I respect the position of saying, look, I'm not going to give reasons for why God damns, right? The tradition says God damns and that, but I'm wondering if you could say something more, because it seems on this free will account, what God really loves isn't sinners, the persons. What God loves is the moral game right? Like you're born, you have a chance to make a fundamental option. That's why you're created. And that's what God wanted from creation. So God got what he wanted at creation. And what I always want to ask the free will person at the end is like, so do you admit that God loses? And C.S. Lewis says that. He says, yeah, God loses, right? That's the, the greatest feat of divine omnipotence to do this sort of like simsum kenosis where God like gives up God's power, right? But it just seems like in the classical account, that can't be the case. Right? God doesn't lose. So is in your position, does God lose or does God win when my freedom even chooses against him? Thank you. So, I mean, the, the 
just thinking about the time here, two two short responses that come to mind for me is that without being you know terribly head up on um, libertarian free will as such, I still think that God's permissive will is a useful and rigorous category. And I think that you can, um, what you describe as his losses, can meaningfully uh, be put under that header. Um, But the other thing I would say, to your point, is that when I was trying to describe the universalist position earlier and I talked about its appeal, where I really think you're going with this is that, um, or at least what I draw out of it is that universalism is really great for theodicy. <laughs> and that's why, that's why um, for totally non-emotional reasons, a lot of people find it, you know, increasingly, I think, appealing. Um, in the front. If that's, oh. Thank you. Um, so Augustine, I think this is quoted from Augustine. He says, God created you without you, but he can't save you without you. I guess my question is for Jordan. Um, kind of rhetorical, kind of not. Can we reject God's mercy? It seems like we do on a daily basis whenever we sin. So can it just logically flow from that that we could reject infinite mercy? Like if we can, if we can reject it in time, can't we reject it sort of out, outside of time, eternally, resulting in eternal hell. Thank you. Um, Well, even if that were possible, I would want to note that that seems to be a pretty radical development of the magisterial tradition, which says that if you die in more, over and over again, if you die in mortal sin, actual mortal sin, it's definitive. If it's definitive, you don't need to continue to reject. You did once for all. So that might be an interpretation we could go with, but it's no less a speculative read of scripture and, and the tradition, I think, than, than any other. But also Augustine says in uh, his tractates on, on, and homilies on First John, at one moment he says, do not, say, he even uses the example of Saul of Tarsus being knocked off of his ass, uh, onto his ass, if you, if you will, um, and, uh, and says, do not think that if God, if God's love and mercy changes you, that you are thereby violated. And he uses Saul's conversion as an example. So even though he's, he, he has that quote that you, you said, I also think he has uh, quite a lot of room to say that God could, in fact, um, tor- turn your will, I mean, it would still be your will. I mean, and so um, I, don't, I don't think Augustine's thought fully lends itself to the, I don't think it's, you know, uh, a libertarian. In fact, Ad Sulpicianum seems to be very much against that. Um, the only one who can make that sort of choice outside of time would be God, not you. Um, or let's say, let's go to the angels or something in the case of the angels. Even Thomas is going to say that, they, uh, that the angels are in potency to their supernatural goods, which means it's still an act. Uh, I would quibble with the way he characterizes that, the, that decision, um, but that's would get us off. But uh, but I think, I think too, like the, the last little point I would make about that is um, I'm actually a little bit more comfortable with the, again, with Ratzinger's sort of thing about the, in, the, the response is not one moment or another, it's the entire life. He says, look, the whole pathways of, of one's life constitutes and comes together to make one response to God. And so I, I see nothing at all. Uh, I, I think if we give due weight to that sort of move that Ratzinger and many others make, then... Um, I think we should be uh, a little bit more careful about absolutizing our experience of what is really less than freedom and pretend that that is the absolute character of freedom. What we're talking about is becoming free. What we experience every day is the failure to be free, not being free. There is a mode proper to becoming free versus freedom. That's something that St. Anselm makes a huge point about. Uh, Otherwise, God's not free. Otherwise, Christ wasn't really human and free because he couldn't sin. Um, so um, this is a far more paradoxical state that we're in than just, well, we're free so we can reject God's grace and mercy. No, you're not free. You're enslaved to sin. And the truth sets you free, according to the Gospel of John. What is the process by which the truth sets you free? 
There is no formula for that. That's called life. And there I think Augustine is far more phenomenologically compelling because he at least, I think, senses that deep down, in, especially in, in, in the homilies on First John, that God is not bound by this sort of calculus. God knows how to get to you if he wants to. Now, for Augustine, whether or not he wants to, that's a different question. Nevertheless, I think he's right about the first point. Uh, so, sure, you can reject grace, but that doesn't tell me much about how it is that you come to accept grace. And is that transition rational? And, and this, not in the sense of um, apodictic, like necessity of a syllogism, a formal necessity. I mean, is it, is, are there reasons for it, or is it just like a spontaneous eruption that happens to turn you the right way? No, no, no. It's, it, it's, and this is the other thing, the phenomenological point that I think Rob was talking about as well. The other thing we experience, at least I do daily every time I interact with, not every time, that, that would be a total lie. Daily, though, nonetheless, with my children, is I have moments where I look at them, I see them playing outside or whatever they're doing. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, it's not all pie, you know, pie in the sky stuff. A lot of times I'm getting angry and sinning and all that. But nevertheless, there are moments very frequently where I look at them, like say when they were born, <laughs> everything else has been downhill. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, shoot, this is recorded. I love you, kids. Um, no, but like say when they were born or you know, when they learn something or when they say something or, uh, uh, or they do something. And it just in, in, in these moments, I experience being moved. And I would put it in the passive voice. Well, we could do that with anything. Art, a, a sufficiently beautiful piece of art, or whatever. We, we're moved. And we say that I am moved. It doesn't mean you're shackled. So somehow there's a convergence of freedom and necessity in the most poignant moments of life. Love, beauty, a sunset the birth of my daughters. Am I violated? Because I couldn't choose otherwise? But then here's the next question. Maybe other people would agree. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. How did I get to that state? There is no simple abstract logic for that. It is, this is what generates poetry. I don't know what words exactly to put to it and in what order. Surely God knows how to do that if we can. All right, well, let's do one more real quick, and then we'll take camp for a reception. Quick, I guess um, the question is I have is that, I mean, maybe humans can't understand it, but in theory, at one point, there was no hell. You know, presumably, you know, Lucifer wasn't made evil. He was, he loved God, and I always assumed that he loved Michael like a brother, but are we supposed to believe that that's just sort of a golden age that we can never get back to? Or sort of, I guess that's sort of the question I have is that if you think about it, it's like, it is sort of like, is that just the irrecoverable golden age we can never return to as humans? So that's sort of my idea about it. Cause we have to, cause at one point it didn't exist, but now it does. I would say yes. And that, um, if you want to read more about it, it's the subject of the greatest, uh, book ever written in the English language. Um, you can read all about Tartary and sulfur and strange fire in Paradise Lost, which, you know, you can get the behind the scenes look when it, when it came into being, why it's there and why it's not going away. Well, I would say, um, I'm with Balthazar and it seems to me at certain moments with Ratzinger that hell is a Christological category. Um, I think if it were simply a sequential story of, well, God started a project and he really didn't want hell, but all of a sudden he kind of lost control and didn't know what to do and was really puzzled by all these little creatures, almost like he had a Dr. Frankenstein with his monster, he doesn't know what to do with it. Um, that would be maybe aesthetically pleasing, but I don't think that's really worth the trade. Um, instead, I would say the, the, what makes hell fundamentally real is that Christ descended to it. And so the resolution, again, no, it's not an abstract resolution, but it's a Christological one nonetheless, and it's a personal one nonetheless. He's the synthesis. Um, that uh, he will find a way to get to everyone. And so and however you characterize that span or whatever it is an avum is, or an aeon, um, 
it will not be the absolute final destiny of anyone in particular. He goes after the last sheep and finds it. It's not like maybe he'll find it. Hopefully, let's let's uh, cross our fingers and wait and see. Like he finds it. His word never refer- returns to him void. As the rain and the snow falls, and gives seed to the seed and, and, and food to the eater, so shall my word not return to me void. If hell is an absolute counterpoint, an eternal tragedy, set a shadow set over against God's plan, his word is void, at least insofar as hell is just as eternal and absolute as heaven. And that's where I would want to say that we need to be careful about absolutizing the univocal sense of adjectives rather than realizing that adjectives don't just qualify the nouns, but the nouns qualify the adjectives too. The only true eternity is God. All right. Well, with that, thank you guys all again so much for coming and join us. We can continue the conversation, whatever. Thank you so much. Thank you.